Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for showing up. And thanks for the B-Sides organizing theme for organizing everything, uh, making sure everything is working and running smoothly. Uh, Perfect, thank you. Uh, so basically this is my second time here in Pristina. I was here in 2019 for a different conference, so it's always uh, great to be back here and just uh, enjoy the city. Uh, so basically uh, to, today we're going to talk about a topic that is very dear to me, that some, an industry that I've been involved for a decade. Uh, we're gonna talking about we're gonna be talking about big bounties, uh, and I'm gonna share with you some insights that I and lessons that I've learned from my experience doing big bounties as a hacker, hacking different companies like high profile companies, say Facebook, Google, Apple, etc. So I'm gonna be sharing some lessons, some insights that I've learned from that experience, and I'm also gonna be sharing the lessons that I learned actually managing those big bounty programs for some of the biggest companies. Uh, so, but before we start, I just want to have an idea. How many of you here are familiar with the concept of back bounties? Can you raise your hand? Uh, all right, that's good. Uh, how many of you have earned a back bounty before? A bounty payment? All right, I think this is a good start. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. But before we dive into the topic, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Yassine Aboukir. I'm originally from Morocco. I'm uh, currently based in France, uh, so I hold two master degrees. Uh, both of them are in management and business, basically, which is very irrelevant to what I'm doing now as a, as a career. Uh, it just goes to say that it doesn't really matter what you started before, as long as you have the passion to pursue what you really like and what you're really passionate about. So uh, right now I'm doing cybersecurity, apparently. Uh, I do application security consulting. Uh, so basically, I work with companies to provide them with uh, consultant services, say penetration testing, security assessments, and whatever. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, I worked as a security analyst for a company called HackerOne. It's a, a back bounty platform. Uh, I worked as a uh, triager, so basically I triaged for uh, back bounty programs belonging to some of the biggest companies. Where so I'm going to share that experience later on, on the on the presentation. Uh, currently, this year, I actually joined the HackerOne Hacker Advisory Board. So basically, my role is just to ensure that the hacker community is well represented and that the hacker feedback is incorporated in their product and services. And I've been doing back bounties since 2013. So basically, it's been a decade, 10 years. Uh, and I am one of the HackerOne top 20 hackers, all-time top 20 hackers. And last year, I actually won one of the live hacking competitions back in Denver. Uh, as you can see in the picture, I'm holding the MVH belt. I look like a UFC fighter, I know. Uh, so I, I won the first place, which was quite an achievement because like, it was very competitive. So yeah, that's it. But so now we're going to start by just like for the people who are not very familiar with the, what the concept of back bounty program. So a back bounty program is basically when a company, uh, seeks the help of the security research community help. So basically you see a company like Facebook, Google, they want the help of ethical hackers to find security vulnerabilities on their services and products. So they set up, uh, what we call a back bounty program, which has all the kind of roles uh, that you should know before participating. And once someone like a hacker, an ethical hacker or a security researcher finds a security vulnerability, they get paid what we call a bounty, which is a monetary payment. As you can see in this screenshot here, this is an example of PayPal back bounty program, which is hosted on the HackerOne platform. So this is basically how it looks like. And every back bounty program has a set of uh, roles or sections uh, so a back bounty program, they have what we call a bounty table. As you can see here in the screenshot, there's a bounty table. So what is a bounty table? It's just like how the, the, the monetary reward that you can expect when you find a security vulnerabilities, security vulnerability on their product. So if it's a, like a low severity bug, you can expect this much. If it's like a high severity bug, you can expect like 10K, uh, US dollars, or if it's a critical, this is how much you're gonna expect. Uh, and every program has an in-scope vulnerabilities 
these are the security bugs that the company is interested in. They want to hear, they want to hear about, they want you to find those. So they have a list of those in scope bugs. And uh, just like in scope, there are out of scope bugs. Like the company has a list of bugs that they're not really interested in, either because they are informative or they are low severity or it's just basically they are false positives. So as a hacker, you don't want to look for those bugs. You just want to avoid them because they're going to be a waste of time. And every program has rules of engagement. It's like rules that you should abide by. If you're going to start hacking on PayPal, these are some of the rules that you should respect. Some of the rules, for example, is just like uh, to avoid Heavy automation. Just do not run heavy automation on the on the on their products because you're just gonna bring it down. These kind of rules that you have to respect. And then there is the service level agreement. The the ACLA is just like the times that you're gonna expect, like time to acknowledge your report or your bug. How much time are you gonna have to wait to get paid? And how much time are you gonna wait to have the bug? get fixed or resolved. And there is a safe harbor clause, which is optional. Uh, we just started recently talking about it. The safe harbor clause is basically a legal clause that the company is basically stating that as long as you act in good faith, like you have good faith, and you, we're not going to prosecute you. We're not going to pursue any illegal action against you as long as you act in good faith, which is very important because uh, a lot could, could go wrong. So, as you can see, I'm pretty sure you guys are very familiar with these logos. These are the companies, some of the Fortune 500 companies that are running a, their bug bounty program. So, these companies, they're basically working with ethical hackers to find all those security vulnerabilities that may be uh, affecting their own products. So, basically, we have Salesforce, Snapchat, Slack, Facebook, Apple, Google. So, all these companies, they have what we call a bug bounty program. So, if you have the skill set, that it requires, and you can find security vulnerabilities on their products, you could get paid uh, a bounty in exchange. So how I got into back bounties, I just want to share with you my story, how I started doing back bounties. So basically before, uh, when I was in my teenage years, uh, uh, I was very passionate about hacking. I, I loved finding security box in random software. So basically, I just go on the internet, find the random software, and just poking around and find the box on that software. I, I was just doing it for free because I liked it and I enjoyed it. But uh, what I what I did is that when I find a bug, I just basically write the details and I publish it online without even coordinating with the vendor, without notif notifying them to get it fixed or anything. Uh, as you can see here, in, it was back in 2011, 2014, 2013. These are some of the bugs that I posted on the exploit databases. Uh, if, you, if you guys are familiar with Millworm, for example, the exploit DB. So I find a bug and I just post it online without even getting fixed, which is, which is bad because this is not how responsible disclosure works. You have to coordinate with the vendor to like re responsibly notify them of the bug so that they can get it fixed. And then you can publish your, your bug publicly. But I was doing it the wrong way, which I called the irres irresponsible disclosure phase as opposed to responsible disclosure. So because if you're familiar, we, when we're doing bug bounties or just vulnerability disclosure in general, we have what we call a 90 days rule. So basically when you find a bug, you have to report it to the vendor. You have to report it to the company so they can get it fixed. And the company has 90 days to get it fixed. If they don't get it fixed in 90 days, then, and then you can actually publish it with the security community so you can make them aware. Uh, if they get it fixed in a timely manner, then you can share the details, but you, you're not really allowed to share the details publicly before it's fixed. Otherwise, it's an Uday. It's going to be exploited maliciously. Uh, so fast forward to 2013, I was just scrolling uh, some art, reading about some news articles, and I, uh, I stumbled upon an article that is about a platform called HackerOne, and that now you can actually work with companies, you can hack companies legally, and actually get paid for it, because I was doing it for free back then. So that was an intriguing idea, and I, I just went straight on HackerOne platform, and I signed up in 2013. So I started poking around, and what I found is they have... Uh, a lot of open source projects like Python, Django, Ruby on Rails. So basically, they want you to find bugs on those projects. But back then, I don't have, I didn't have really the right skill set. I did not have much code review skill set. So I couldn't find anything in 2013. I was just poking around, but no luck at all. 
Uh, so fast forward to 2014, like one year later, I found my first bug. My first bug and I earned my first bounty. It was the dumbest bug I ever found, honestly. So it was, uh, it was on Yahoo. I found it on Yahoo. Uh, so basically the bug was just like resetting the vote. So Yahoo, they have this board, this suggestion board, where users, they can post suggestions and other users, they can upvote and downvote the suggestion. So I was just poking around and I, when you upvote the suggestion, there is a parameter called vote value. It just increments by one, right? So I was just like thinking, what, what can I do here? And I changed the value of the vote value to 1600, which is a long number. And I just clicked on upvote. And what happened next is just I received the votes to zero. If you can see here, it was like 300, 357 and then zero. This is the dumbest bug I ever found. It was a low bug, but fortunately I got paid for it. I submitted it to Yahoo was back in 2014 and I got my very first bounty which was like 400 bucks and I always just I did not believe it because I I was doing this this for free and now I get paid for it and I can do it legally I can hack a company and get paid for it which is which is awesome and I I couldn't really believe it so I was like is this real and I was still in university and the next summer I just spent it just looking for bugs I spent the whole summer just hacking companies because I this is this is too real for me to so let's talk about some common bug hunting methodologies. Like when you're approaching a target, what can you do? Like how can you approach a target? Like from my experience, just from talking with other bug hunters, from with other hackers, there are basic. I, I realized that there are basically four methodologies when you're hacking. There are some people when they're looking for bugs, when they're looking for security vulnerabilities, they automate everything. They basically automate everything. They don't do anything manual. Like they've built their automation that they deploy to servers and the automation just continuously looking for bugs and they don't do any manual work, which is awesome. Uh, but there are other people, they do f full manual. The full manual methodology is when you're actually going deep on the, on the application and you're doing the manual hacking without any automation, without any tools, apart from some necessary tools like a web proxy, for example. Uh, so there are some people who likes to, uh, who like to do full ma manual hacking, which is cool. And there are some other people who do the, what I call the 50-50. Uh, this is my methodology, which is basically the, f the first phase of hacking you do with, with, aut with automation. I mean, you use a lot of tools to collect data, like do some reconnaissance, fight some subdomains, DNS data, fingerprinting, all that stuff. And then once you collect that data, then you can do the manual uh, hacking, then you can use that data to actually start manually hacking and looking for security vulnerabilities on that data. So this is my methodology. And there are some people, they do what I call the zero day all the things. So basically these people, they, they go and look for bugs on software that, that are widely used by the, the, the companies. For example, WordPress. They go and look for a bug on WordPress, a zero day. And then once they find this bug on WordPress, they look for all the companies that use WordPress and then they submit those reports to them. So they basically do security research and they find zero days and then they find all the companies that use that vulnerable software or technology. Perfect. I don't know what happened there. Uh, so the question here is which one of these methodologies actually best? That is the natural question. Which one should you go for? Actually, uh, the thing is that all these methodologies are, have proven to be effective. They have proven to be successful. As you can see here, on each category, there is a successful bug hunter who have made millions just using that methodology. For example, the full automated, we have Eric. Today is new. He's one of the best hackers. He, he, he's a very successful and a million dollar bug bounty. He doesn't do any manual uh, hacking. He basically built an automation machine that is continuously working and looking for bugs uh, on a daily basis like oh it's just working he's not he's not doing any manual manual work and then the full manual we have ron he's a very successful bug hunter as well ron just doesn't do any ma automation uh, as opposed to eric he just like to do manual hacking just go uh, deep on the application understand it and just find logical bugs and the 50 50 we have the legendary franz rosen one of the best hackers and we have shops for the zero day all the things shops he is one of the co-founder acid 
note if you go to acidnote.com they have so many uh blog posts about zero day vulnerabilities that they found on uh, on software uh on popular software so basically he finds o days and he just uh, submit those o days to bug bounty programs and it works it works for him so they made good money out of it and they're very successful that means that all the methodologies actually work i mean depends on you but the, the, if, if each methodology can come at a, at a cost for example the full automated one it might be very costly because you're running a lot of servers so it might be very costly to run those cloud servers uh, the full manual you might just be manually hacking and then you might not find any bug at all so there is a cost for each of these met methodologies uh, so go big or go home like like these successful bug hunters, these successful hackers, one of the things one of the things that I noticed is that they all try to focus on high severity security vulnerabilities. Uh, high sever high severity security vulnerabilities like P1, which is critical vulnerabilities, these are usually server side bugs. Uh, could be an RCE, SQL injection, SSRF, or P2, uh, high severity bugs, a stored XSS, an account takeover, authentication, bay pass. So all these bug hunters, I noticed, I observed that they are actually focusing on P1, and P2, which, which makes sense. Why? Because, first of all, they're avoiding duplicates and related frustrations. Because in bug bounty, you have to be the first one to find the bug to actually get paid. If you find the bug, but someone found it, like before you, you're not going to get paid. It's, it's gonna be, going to be a duplicate. But when you're focused on P1, P2, not a lot of people are actually focusing on that kind of vulnerabilities. And they're not easy to be found as well. So you're avoiding the duplicate frustration. Also, when you send a, a high severity back to a company, they quickly fix it. They have to quickly react. Otherwise, it's going to be exploited maliciously. So they quickly get it triaged and fixed, which is good. Uh, and then you have high monetary rewards. So basically when you're focusing on P1 and P2, you're gonna earn a lot more than actually focusing on low severity and medium bugs. I'm not seeing by any chance that you should avoid looking for low severity or medium bugs. It's just that you you have to shift your focus to looking for P1 and P2 bugs if you've got the right skill set. And then, when you're doing bug hunting, you want to focus on healthy and high PN bug bounty programs. There is a lot of frustration that can originate from doing bug bounty. There are so many companies running a bug bounty, but they're not all great because like sometimes you submit a report to a company and you have to wait months before they even respond to you or you have to wait months before you get paid. So you want to be picky when you choose which company you want to hack on. These are two companies, for example, which are amazing. First one is GitLab, if you're familiar with it. And the second one is Shopify. GitLab, for example, for a critical, they pay up to 35K, which is great. It's a, it's a good return on investment. Uh, and Shopify can even pay 200K for a critical vulnerability. That's why I'm saying you have to focus on P1 and P2, because it, there is a high monetary reward out of it. And these companies are very healthy. They have a great security team, very reactive, all that stuff. Uh, and before you start, before you choose a program, if you, for example, are using the HackerOne platform, you can, on the program, you can see these statistics. These are very important before you start hacking on a program. You see the average time to first response is how much time it's going to take for the company to acknowledge your report to get back to you. How much time, average time to bounty, how much time until you get paid, which is important. You just want to get paid. So it's important to uh, cut it short. And how much time to get your bug fixed. Uh, also, you can see how much, this is a PayPal bug bounty program. This is how much PayPal paid over the years. They paid 8 million uh, bug, uh, bounties in total. And you can see the average bounty that they paid for hackers. Uh, the average is usually 2K to 4, 4K. And sorry, the top bounty is, uh, is, they paid 52 as a top bounty. As you can see, there are all the stats you can check before you start hacking a program, before you decide which company you, you want to hack on. For example, PayPal, people here, ha, ha, they have appealing numbers, which is good. But for also, for a regular bug hunter, when they see the number, the total of bugs that were resolved, you see like it's it's 1,470, which is a lot of bugs. And then as a regular bug hunter mindset, it's like, there's no way I'm going to find a security vulnerability after, after like 700 people found over 1,000 bugs. This is a regular bug hunter mindset, which is really bad. Because like uh, the best hackers, they don't really care about those numbers because they know, regardless of how many bugs other people found, there will always 
there will always be other security vulnerabilities. Why? Because companies, they're pushing code, they're making changes on a daily basis. So they're always like features, new features that are being developed. So there are always new bugs that are being introduced. Same, there are always like regressions. Like they might fix a bug today, but there might, like there might be a code change and so the, the bug might happen, might show up again. So that we call that a regression. So in, it, it doesn't matter how many bugs that program fixed. You can always find bugs on these programs. And these are the, the best programs that you want to focus on. These are the, 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 oh, it's gone again. So these are like the, 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 the big program, like PayPal, they pay really good. They have a great security team. So. All right, so, so I was talking about healthy programs, the programs that pay really good. So these are some of the examples of the programs that are really good that you want to work with. So if you ever decide to hack on some of the programs, some of the companies, I suggest you hack on TikTok, find security vulnerabilities on TikTok, Dropbox, Epic Games, GitHub, Uber, Stripe. These are amazing. I had good experience with them. All right, so let's talk about application-based recon and testing. Uh, so every time I talk to uh, a bug hunter, a hacker, they're, they're just like, they're like obsessed with automation. A lot of them is just like, I, I, I tried this tool and that tool. I'm working on building this automation and that. So everyone is just like really distracted from actually what the in-depth testing and the creative aspect of hacking. Hacking is actually, is, is more fun actually when you're doing it, like you're actually going deep on an application, you're using the creative aspect of it. So a lot of people are just obsessed with automation. I mean, it's not really bad, but it's also not the, 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 it's not very effective. So a lot of people in the hacker community, they, they ignore the core application. A lot of these companies like TikTok, uh, Stripe, uh, Shopify, they really care about the core application. They want you to find bug on the product itself, the core application. As you can see here, for example, Dropbox, they have a separate bounty table and uh, separate bounty amounts just for the core application because they want people to focus on finding bugs on the core app, not just going out of scope or like looking for subdomains and those old outdated assets. They want you to find bugs on the core app, which would pay a lot more than actually finding security bugs on some like outdated subdomain or, or whatever. So you want to focus on the core app, which usually has more importance and priority as well as great compensation. Uh, also, when you talk about reconnaissance, reconnaissance is a very trendy word in the hacking community nowadays. When you ask someone about reconnaissance or recon as we call it, they just start talking about finding subdomains. So basically, reconnaissance ha has been associated with finding subdomains. Uh, Whereas reconnaissance actually goes way beyond just finding subdomains. It's about like doing DNS recon. You find DNS data. You find you do some fingerprinting. There, there, there is a lot you can do with reconnaissance. And also reconnaissance is just not about finding subdomains. We can also talk about the application based reconnaissance, which is actually, it, which is the best recon that has paid off very well for me. The app based reconnaissance is when you actually try to get to know the application, you try to fuzz the application, you use it as a, a regular user and just like click every form, click every button, fill out every form and just use it as a regular user and just intercept all the HTTP requests so you get familiar with it. You can also use the Burp Suite, Burp Suite proxy, uh, uh, spidering functionality so you can have a better visualization of how the app looks like. As you can see in the screenshot, this is a, a, a vis visual visualization of the Zoom API uh, and core application. So this is the kind of reconnaissance that actually paid off very well for me instead of just doing some subdomains reconnaissance. Uh, because you want to really get to get to know the app and really understand it deeply and go in depth. Uh, also, I want to talk about functionality or feature-oriented security testing. Uh, s some people, when they start hacking on an app, they, they go with the assumption, hey, I'm going to focus on finding excesses. So basically, they only look for excesses. Whereas some other people, well, they use a, a, a better strategy, a, a way more effective strategy, which is like, uh, which is like when you when you're testing functionalities, you wanna you wanna think which class of vulnerability would actually apply to this functionality. Uh, for example, if you're if, if you're hacking on an image uploader. You're, you're gonna think which, which, which class of vulnerability would actually apply to this image uploader? What kind of bugs do you think will be there? 
instead of actually going with the assumption, hey, I'm just going to look for excesses and spend all the time just looking for one single class of vulnerability. Uh, so basically, you want to think what kind of bugs will apply to this functionality that I'm testing. Uh, also, focused manual testing requires deep understanding of the inner workings of the app. When you're hacking on an app, you want to understand how it works. A lot of people, they start hacking, for example, on TikTok, Zoom, or they don't even understand the app. They don't, they don't know how it works. They don't know what it does. They don't know how the logic is. So they're just blindly testing, and it's a waste of time. When you're starting hacking on an app, you want to understand how it works. You want to write down everything. You want to sketch down everything and just understand how everything is interconnected, especially if it's a complex application like Shopify, for example. So that, that way you're going to find more logical bugs. You have more chances of finding security vulnerabilities instead of just blindly testing whatever without even understanding what it does. And also, what makes the difference between a regular bug hunter and successful one is the successful bug hunters, the are ready to go the distance. What I mean by, by that is that when you're hacking on an app and there is like some features, you have to pay them. You have to pay the features to get access to it. Some bug hunters, they, don't, they, they wouldn't pay that because they, it's a waste of money. But su successful bug hunters, they will pay for the pro plan so they get access to those features behind the paywall. Because not everyone has tested those features, and which, is a, uh, which will give you a competitive advantage. So another thing is that you, you have to be willing to go the distance. For example, what I mean by that is that there are some apps uh, that requires you to complete a setup uh, there is like a complex setup. Some people are very lazy to complete the setup, uh, but successful bug hunters, they take their time to, to configure everything and just set it up because that will, that will make the difference. Or if the company has a hardware device, you want to order it because you, you have more chances of finding bugs on that device. Or just like if there, there's a documentation, make sure you read the whole documentation so that you understand everything and that you will have more chances of finding more security vulnerabilities. So always be ready to go to distance. Uh, okay, this is a, in related to what I'm just saying, this is a, a vulnerability that I found last year in a live hacking competition with a friend of mine, Andre. Uh, so basically this application, this was supposed to be a very secure messaging app that I used by governments. Uh, I'm not allowed to disclose the name of the company because it's private. But the, the, what I'm saying is that this this, com the, uh, this company they have first they have the SSO, which is a feature, which is a pro feature. You have to pay to get access to it. Uh, we paid to get access to that feature, and I'm pretty sure a lot of the hackers that were with me in the live hacking event they did not pay for it. That made the difference. That's how we found this bug. So we paid the for, to access the we paid the pro plan to access the SSO feature, and also. Setting up the SSO took a lot of time, and I'm pretty sure a lot of hackers would have just skipped it because it takes so much time. But we took our time to set up everything, and basically, this was an account takeover. We could like take over, hack any account without zero, with zero interaction. So what, what was happening is that uh, when we set up our SSO, uh, we used Okta, for example, and in our Okta instance, we can add the, the user, the, our target, our victim's email, that is on the vulnerable app. So we add it to our Okta, which is which you can do. Uh, and then what we try to do next is we try to, to SSO to the vulnerable application. So when we reach the Okta login page, we are logged into our email, the victim's email that we added to our Okta instance. And then what happened is that there was uh, an improper validation and then we would be able to log into any user's email. So basically we could just, we just need the victim's email, we add it to our Okta instance, we initiate the SSO login, and then we would log into their account. So basically this was very simple bug, but very impactful because we could hack any account without any user interaction, and it was you know, it got paid as a critical. It was got the highest bounty amount. Uh, this is a second example. This is another bug that we found last year. It was in, in a different live hacking competition. Uh, this is an SSRF a server side request forgery. Uh, so basically, this company they have an API and. I was just browsing the documentation. So what made the difference here is the documentation. I had to, I read the documentation. I took my time to read the documentation, whereas some people did not do that. So that made, that made the difference. So basically I was just reading the API documentation and I, I noticed this request. And what, the first thing that, uh, that 
caught my attention was the URL parameter. So basically, when you see a URL parameter, the first thing that comes to mind is to test it against ACSRF, which is a server-side bug. It's very critical. So, uh, but when I tried to replicate the HTTP request, it did not work. Why? Because uh, first of all, uh, reading the documentation, I realized that I need to set up a separate user account. And for that user account, I need to explicitly grant it the API permissions. And even after granting the API permissions, I need to generate valid API credential for that separate user account just so I could reproduce this, uh, this uh, API request. So the first thing I did was to point the URL to, uh, to the local, local host, loop back the local host address so I can reach the, the organization internal network. When I did that, it did not work. Uh, I got, uh, I basically I got an unauthorized. I don't have the uh, the response here. But when I tried the typical payload, the local host API did not work. So I tried a bunch of B passes, and the one that actually worked was using the EPv6 format, as you can see there. I used the EPv6 format, and it worked, and I got the response, as you can see here. I got access to their local host internal network. Uh, so basically, this one got paid uh, cr as a critical. I just, just want to demonstrate that what made the difference here is just I, I, I took the time to read the documentation. Uh, some people may have read it, but they did not did not completely understand it from my from talking to them. So that's what makes the difference, just like going the distance. All right, so another thing that I recommend is just like fuzzing all the things. Fuzzing is very powerful. Literally fuzz everything. There are so many tools that uh, allows you to do fuzzing, especially when you're hacking from a black box approach. Uh, fuzz the endpoints. You can fuzz the parameters. You can fuzz the directories, everything. And even when fuzzing, a lot of people, a lot of people do is just they use generic word list. They use a word list for everything. But what I do recommend is that you use a, what we call a context-based word list. For example, if you're fuzzing a, a WordPress uh, installation, you want to use a word list that is very adapted to the WordPress uh, installation. If you're fuzzing, let's say, an ESP uh, target, you want to use an adaptive word list. And for that, I recommend, for example, Asset Note. They have a different, so many the uh, different word sets based on what kind of technology do you want to start fuzzing. Fuzzing is very powerful. You're going to find all kind of stuff doing it. This is a, another simple bug, just doing fuzzing. Well, I found it last year. So I found this, uh, uh, which allowed me to access the admin panel of, of a company. It was an internal support panel. So what I did, so basically doing some recon, I found an internal admin portal. It was like admin.redacted.com because it's a private company. I don't want to disclose the name. So it's like admin.redacted.com slash account. I, I just ran Fuff, uh, which is very, Fuff is an amazing tool that you can use for fuzzing. Uh, it's, it's built in Gulang. It's relatively fast. Uh, so we just used Fuff to brute force the directories, like from account, brute force the directories. And what I found is account slash register. Very easy, very stupid. Uh, register and but that means that I could register my own account and become an admin of that pan of that portal panel. So basically, I can re I was able to register an account as an admin. And what is funny is that I could explicitly give myself as many permissions as I want. As you can see, all the permissions there. Uh, the the register endpoint sh shouldn't have been public. It should not have been public uh, because it's an internal panel. So now everyone can just register an admin account. And I got access to their internal panel. So fuzzing is very important. It's very powerful, especially if you're doing black box uh, hacking. You don't have much information about the target. Uh, another thing is JavaScript. Ja I love JavaScript. I've found so many bugs just reading JavaScript files because uh, JavaScript, uh, a lot, all the modern applications, they use JavaScript to load different things like endpoints, parameters, and all that stuff. So when I'm hacking on an app, I, I literally, first thing I do is just I gather all the JavaScript files that are being fetched or loaded by the, that app because I know in those JavaScript I can find endpoints, I can find parameters, I can find hard coded, hard coded credentials, API keys, everything. So reading and inspecting JavaScript files is very important. It's, it's one, uh, I've got a friend of mine, he got like probably 80% of his bugs are 
post message bugs from JavaScript files. So I highly recommend that you read JavaScript. When I, I'm hacking on an app, I use Burp Suite. So basically I just filter by GS, I, by JavaScript files, and I copy all the JavaScript links, and then those links, I feed them to the link finder Pi, which is a tool that you can use to automate the JavaScript files inspection and it gives you all the endpoints that it extracts from those JavaScript files. And those endpoints might be, might be new features, might be invisible, not used in the main app. So it, it will give you a competitive advantage. Okay, this is a this is another bug vulnerability that I found last year again in a live hacking event. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people missed it because they haven't they haven't thoroughly read those JavaScript files. So what happened here is that I was able to take over uh, any account on three uh, three multiple three different services for this company. Uh, so basically, I was just looking at the JavaScript files. And I found this endpoint, the first one, partner connect. So I found this endpoint. Uh, there is the path parameter. So when you navigate to that endpoint, you are actually being redirected to their entertainment service. It's the, so basically they're using that, this endpoint for authentication. Uh, so basically the path parameter was intriguing. So I was like, okay, let's try an open redirect on this path parameter. So I tried the most typical payload, which was just using the dot uh, example.com. So basically the, 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 the company's domain will become a subdomain. And then the path, I realized that the path parameter was, was uh, vulnerable to an open redirect vulnerability. And what is intriguing here is that when the redirection happens, it actually leaks the user access token. And I can use that access token to take over to uh, interact with to interact with the user with the victim's account. So basically, here the, what I'm just gonna what I'm just saying is that I found it because I I read the JavaScript. That's how I found that endpoint, and that's how I found those parameters and constructed them. And this allowed me to take uh, over their entertain the user entertainment account. As you can see in the use case parameter, it, it equals entertainment. There was also a dining one. There is another uh, service called. Uh, Travel, so basically I can take over three, uh, three services. And it was paid as, as a high severity bug. All right, so we, we're just talking about JavaScript files and how they important they are because they have so many juicy stuff in there. But one, one other thing that you can actually do is that you monitor the changes. Because like, in those JavaScripts, uh, a lot of developers, as I, I said earlier, they are always pushing new code, they are always building new features, they are building new stuff. So, so they are always changing these JavaScript files. What you want to do is you monitor them. You monitor them so they, if, when they change something in that JavaScript, you get a notification and you are the first one to check it. So uh, I recommend that if you want to monitor these JavaScripts, this is a, I rec this is a tool that I, I recommend. I, I, I contributed to building it. It, it is called JSMong. So basically, you give it the JavaScript links and it just monitors them on a daily basis. And then when, is, when there is a change on that JavaScript file, you just get a notification. And this will give you a competitive advantage because you're going to be the first one to check for the new changes. Maybe you'll find uh, something vulnerable. Uh, similarly, I, I mentioned earlier that you should be fuzzing endpoints, parameters, everything. Uh, one way you can do that is one of my favorite extensions. Is, it is called Paraminer. Paraminer basically allows you to uh, enumerate parameters when you have an HTTP request. Uh, and then you don't have much information about that HTTP request. You might use Paraminer so you can actually enumerate hidden parameters. You can enumerate uh, uh, headers. Uh, uh, and and a lot of stuff that you can enumerate with Paraminer. It has a huge word list. It actually works very well. I've had really good success with it, and I highly recommend it. Uh, the, there were, were times when I found like a hidden header that was vulnerable to a SQL injection. Uh, there was a time when I found a hidden parameter called URL, which was also vulnerable to an ECSRF vulnerability. So there is so much you can do with Paraminer. And just talking about the application level, uh, application-based reconnaissance. Here we are just talking about application-based reconnaissance. We're not talking about enumerating subdomains or whatever, because this is way more important actually. And one way to actually enumerate endpoints is to use the the tool that I call Go. This is 
the best tool ever. And props to Carbon who built this tool. So basically, this one, uh, when you give it the, 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 the asset, the target that you want, it just uh, gives you all the endpoints that were previously indexed in like the internet archive or indexed somewhere else. So basically you have, uh, uh, you have an access, access to a, a whole lot of endpoints that you can start hacking on. So this, this tool is really amazing. Great success with it as well. So I highly recommend it. All right. Scope is negotiable. Uh, basically when you're hacking on a program, there is like, there is an in scope assets. The company tells you, you only hack on these assets, these domain names. Don't hack on, on this. Dominance. So we call it the scope. So basically, when 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 you're hacking on an app, sometimes you're limited. Sometimes the app is very limited. You you don't have much access. What I, I what I suggest is that you expand the scope. How? You check if the company has. So basically, if you're hacking the website, their website, check if the if the company has a mobile app. Check maybe they have a browser extension, or maybe they have desktop app, or just some other kind of app. When when they have these, you can just decompile them, not necessarily to hack on them, but just decompile them to gather all the leads and insights in, inside those apps. Maybe you'll find hard-coded endpoints, you'll find juicy hard-coded uh, credentials. So this is the way to expand the scope. This is basically may sound like going out of scope, but as long as you're not necessarily mainly hacking on that app, you're gonna be fine. So as I, yeah, I mentioned it there, never hack, Never hack on out of scope assets, but only use it to collect insights and that list. This is this, an example, another vulnerability. So basically, I was hacking on this company. I've been hacking on it for like two years. And at one point, uh, I couldn't find anything anymore. Uh, the scope just seems very limiting. But this company, they had an extension, uh, a browser extension. The browser extension was not part of the scope. But uh, I, I, needed, I needed some further leads that can help me to hack on the mean scope. So what I did, I downloaded the extension, I decompiled it, which is pretty easy. Uh, I decompiled the, the browser extension, and yeah, so it had three million installs, which is pretty pretty high. Uh, so I decompiled it. The first thing I did, I reviewed the manifest.json file, because when you decompile a uh, Chrome extension, for example, there is always a manifest JSON that has some definitions. So what I noticed is that they have some whitelisted domain names. This one I call it evm-target.com. So this one was whitelisted there. And what I noticed is that this domain name, it was whitelisted, but it was expired. I mean, I could buy it. I could purchase that domain name for 12 euros. But I, I was like looking for what can I use this domain name for? Even if I purchase it, what can I, what can I use it for? Is there something I can do with it? So I, I do, I mean, I do, I, I dived into the, the, the code analysis. And what I found in the, the, the code is that there is a rejects validation that it, it was checking for whitelisted domain names. It was checking if those that domain name is whitelisted or not. If it's whitelisted, if it's whitelisted, then the extension will push a header, will append a header to the user request with the, as you can see below, XWB session with the user session. So basically, if I purchase that domain name, right, and there is a victim that is using the Chrome extension, and then they visit that domain name, their, their HTTP request will contain their session. So I can, I can, I can freely extract it because they're visiting my own website. So that's what I basically did. I just purchased that domain name. I set up my POC. So basically when I send the victim, when I send the, the website to the victim and they access it, I can extract their session from the header because it, because my domain name that I purchased was whitelisted. So that was a, that was an account takeover again. It was a, it was a high severity bug. As I said, just to expand the scope if you're limited, try to explore other things that the company might have on the side. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, I bought the domain name. When the user ac accesses my domain name, there is a session token that is appended to their header. I can, I can extract it and I can show it there as you can see the, from the POC. All right. Uh, just talking about uh, uh, understanding the app, this is a vulnerability that I found. Uh, 
that really required a deep understanding of the application. So basically, this is a company that I've been hacking for three years, and I haven't found this one until until last year because it really required deep understanding of the app, and because it's a bit complicated. So it was an account takeover due to broken authentication. So what was happening is that when the user tries to log into the developer portal there, when they navigate to the sign-in page, there is an OAuth flow that is being initiated. And the OAuth flow, as you can see here, I noticed there is a correlation ID parameter. I did not know what it, what it, what it, what it was doing, but it was, it was very intriguing. So when the user uh, enters their email address and password, then they log in. What happens next is that the, the user is redirected to a login callback with the correlation ID that is being authenticated. So the correlation ID is being taken and then s sent to an auth callback, which then returns the authorization code. So basically, it's, the user navigates to the sign-in page. There is an auth flow that is being initiated with a correlation ID. When the user logs into the page, there is the correlation ID is being sent to the login callback, and then the, there is the authorization code that is being returned. So I was like, I was like thinking, how can I hack this one? What can I, what I, what can I do here? So. What I found is that actually I can generate my own login login link with my own correlation ID, because basically if you know the the user's correlation ID, you can generate their authorization code. So basically, I generated my own uh, login link with my own correlation ID, as you can see there. Then I send it to the victim. So basically, when the victim logs, they log into their account. The correlation ID has become authenticated. So basically, I have the correlation ID. So I can send the correlation ID to an OAuth endpoint so I can exchange it with an authorization token. But the catch here is that I have to beat the user. I have to be the first one to exchange the correlation ID into, into, into an OAuth uh, authorization account. So in this step, I had, I had to automate it. So basically, when the user logs in, I quickly exchange the correlation ID into an authorization code. And that was an account takeover in that one. And I haven't found it until like three years later because I, I it really required understanding the app. Let's talk about automation. I've mentioned automation quite a few times, but let's, let's talk about it. So when we talk about automation, there are, there are different uh, aspects of automation that we talk about. The first one is automating recon and content discovery. By this, I mean just like automating the data collection. It could be uh, collecting subdomains, DNS records, or just port scanning, directory, and file enumerations. Uh, there are so many tools to achieve this. This is one of part of the automation. We also talk about automating, automating vulnerability discovery. Uh, it's basically automating uh, vulnerability discovery. It could be active or passive vulnerability scanning. So basically, you're automating the scanning instead of jo doing the manual thing. Also, we talk about automating change, changes monitoring. As I mentioned earlier, you can automate monitoring JavaScript files. Uh, so you don't have to check on the JavaScript every once in a while. You can just automate that. We we'll also talk about automating repetitive tasks, some boring tasks that you always do manually. You can automate that. You can just write a script to just automate it so you don't have to do the boring task. And for these categories, for each category, we have a bunch of tools that you can use. Uh, for the recon, for example, there is MS, Hackcrawler, HTTPS, DNSX. There's so many tools that you can use for automation. You, you don't even need to build your own uh, tools anymore. There's there's so many open open source tools that you can use for for the vulnerability, the, the automated vulnerability discovery. There is Nuclea. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with Nuclea as well. Uh, sorry, uh, and for the changes, you can use MS. Sablord is my tool to to monitor the subdomain uh, enumeration, and then we have uh, other tools for repetitive tasks. So. When we talk about automation, this is a simple flow that you can build your own uh, yourself if you want to build your own automation. So this is a this is a this is a simple reconnaissance flow. It starts from the first step, which is loading the scope. Loading basically, you go to a, a hacker one like a bug bounty platform, and you extract all the assets that are in scope that the companies are interested in. So you extract everything. You can use BBScope tool, which allows you to extract everything in an automatic way. And the step, the second way, the second thing you want to do when you have 
the assets you want to hack is to run subdomain enumerations or enumeration on those assets so you can find subdomains you can see some tools that you can use I use emas and then you can use permutation te technique this is a ma an amazing technique that I really recommend permutation is basically when you find a subdomain say for example admin dot example dot com you can you can try permutation which is like admin dash uh, test or admin dash uh, prod this is the, this is what we call permutation you permute different words so you can find so you can find more subdomains and after you do permutation you can run dns resolution so you can find the 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 subdomains they're actually they're actually resolving and then you can do dns enumeration port scanning with inmap and then the last step is vulnerability disclosure once you have all that data you can run vulnerability scanning on it so you can find bugs so this is a simple uh, flow if you want to build your own automation this is a this is a project of mine that I've been working on with a friend of mine Maluk last year uh, so we've been, we've been working on building our own uh, our own automation uh, this is how it looks like uh, so we basically built it with Python on, on top of Django framework uh, we used Luigi for tasks orchest orchestration bootstrap for the for the interface and we used Postgres for the database uh, for the open for the tools that we used, we basically used inmap which is a classic we used emas for subdomain enumeration we used a bunch of port discovery uh, projects like HTTPX and nuclei for vulnerability scanning so this is how it looks like we can add assets we can edit assets uh, this is the this is the notifications we would get when there is a when the automation finds a vulnerability when we find a, a, an account take uh, uh, subdomain takeover for example uh, this is our dashboard the total we, we were monitoring 84 uh, how much is that? Eight million assets. We were continuously monitoring eight million assets. We've got like fifty-five thousand vulnerabilities. A lot of them are actually informative because we did not filter filter it out. So if you want to build the automation, it's it's as easy as that as I, I showed you earlier. But but one thing that you know is that there is there are so many open source projects as I mentioned. There are so many open source tools. You don't even need to build your own tools. You can just use those open source in your automation. Uh, also. One thing is that automation should be complementary. What I mean by that is that you should be focusing on manual hacking. Automation, you just use it to find some bugs that, uh, like for example, low hanging fruits. Uh, you want to focus on high severity bugs and then use automation to find some low hanging fruits, some easy bugs on this side. But you always want to focus on manual hacking. Also, efficient automation should give you uh, actionable actionable bugs. If your automation is just finding false positives, like uh, informative bugs, something that is not actionable, then it's just wasting your time. So you want to make sure that your automation is actually finding security bugs. Uh, the challenge is task or orchestration. Uh, a lot of people, they, they build their automation, but it's just using a bunch of bash scripts. And if one script uh, breaks down, the whole uh, automation breaks down. So you want to use some tools for task orchestration. We used Luigi, which was built by Spotify. And then you want to do load distribution across multiple servers. Because when you're doing automation, you're, you're, you're monitoring so many assets. You cannot do that on one server. You need so many different servers. So you need to... Uh, Balance the load across multiple services. You can use Kubernetes, for example, or you can use Fleet and Axiom, which is very compatible with back bounty hunting. Uh, also, most back bounty automation they catch low hanging fruits, uh, and as I mentioned, the, the low severity and medium severity bugs they usually just gonna result in me in duplicates, which is frustrating. And as I mentioned, there are so many automation frameworks that you can just install. You don't have to build your own. There is Recon for the win, Osmetus, Reengine, Axiom, etc. Also, one of the most powerful tools that just uh, been developed is Nucle, which is a vulnerability scanner. Basically, a lot of bug hunters they're using it blindly. So basically, they just use Nucle with the existing templates, uh, which is which is which is not an effective approach because other bug, other bug hunters they're doing exactly the same. So you're not doing anything different. So basically, you're just gonna get so many duplicates. If you're using the Nucle tool uh, you know, there below, you want to do your own security research and build your own tem templates and feed them to the tool. Yeah, exactly, as I mentioned here. So basically, we were always taught, like, when I started hacking, I did not know how to code. So basically, I started hacking without even any coding knowledge. And I did I did fine. Honestly, I did really fine. But just like uh, over the years, you realize that actually coding is very important. 
coding and reading code is going to give you a competitive advantage. So you, you can actually start hacking without any code knowledge. You can do it from a black box approach. But at one point, if you want to step up your game, if you want to be a good hacker, you want to learn how to code, you want to learn to read the code because it's very necessary and will give you a very competitive advantage. Uh, as I said, black box testing is fun, but when you can actually read the code, you're going to find way more bugs. Uh, even, even some bugs like the excesses, the client side bugs, like just a DOM based excess, it requires a certain understanding of JavaScript to find it. So at one point, it's very important to learn how to code. Uh, also, you can use that skill to find zero day vulnerabilities in software. You can find zero day vulnerabilities, for example, in WordPress, you can read the code, find an, uh, a bug, and then you can check and find all the companies that use WordPress and then you're going to get bounties from that. So basically, you can use it for OD research. And also, when you're doing security research, I recommend you look for pre-authenticated or unauthenticated vulnerabilities. Because like when you're participating in Back Bounty, you cannot just tell the organization, hey, you need to log into your account, so then you can upload this web shell. So basically, you want you, are, you should be interested in finding unauthenticated vulnerabilities if, you're, if you want to do Back Bounties. So another thing that I recommend is monitoring for new CVEs. Uh, uh, so when there is a, a, a new vulnerability that was found, it's usually being assigned a CVE for tracking for tracking purposes. And what I personally do is I track, I monitor the CVE, the new CVEs. Uh, so when there is a new CVE that is being pushed, I get notified. I know there is a new vulnerability that was being found, so I can actually go and look for it on other companies. Uh, so you want to monitor CVEs, and I highly recommend uh, you check Attacker KB, which is a basically kind of a forum where other security researchers they discuss new vulnerabilities. You can find POCs, you can find exploits there that you can basically use in your bug hunting or hacking. Also, if you want to get into security research, uh, th these are some of the uh, references, some of the sources that I highly recommend. So there is this article by James Kettle, very, very good security researchers if you want to get into security researching. There is the Acid Note blog. You can find so many uh, bugs that are being e explained in a very good way with the technical details and, and the exploit as well. The OWASP code review guide, the Paintester Lab code review exercise. There are some amazing exercises if you guys want to get into uh, uh, into uh, uh, code uh, analysis. And there is the AWA certificate. If you guys, if you, there are some of you who are interested in certificates, I recommend the Advanced Web Attacks and the Explosion Cert. It's a very good one. Uh, has good reputation, and the Offsec Certs have good reputation, reputation as well. All right. So let's talk about security impact. So basically, when you're hacking, uh, when you're doing back bounties. It's not like doing a penetration testing. You have to show impact. When you find a bug, if it doesn't have a security impact, then it's not really a bug. So when you're doing bug bounties, you have to demonstrate for the organization that your bug actually has an actual security impact. For example, here, uh, if you find an XSS and then you just tell the organization, hey, I found this pop-up. I can just do this JavaScript pop-up. Or you can actually show them that you can use the XSS to hijack the user session token. Which one do you think would get paid more? The simple pop-up below or the, the one where the, the attacker has demonstrated they can use the XSS for session exfiltration? I'm pretty sure the first one will get paid a lot more than the first example. It's, the, it's one bug, but you have to demonstrate what you can do with it. Because this is not a pen testing. You, if you're doing back bounties, it's not a penetration testing where you can just like a report the bug. You have to show actual impact. You have to show the organization what you can do with it. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, bug bounty is not a traditional pen test, so you have to demonstrate security impact, which is very important. Uh, always ask this question. If you find a bug, what is the worst thing I can do with this vulnerability? So always, you want to always maximize the impact, always the escalate. Uh, and also, most companies, they pay bounties based on CVSS. CVSS is a standard, uh, is a standard that we use in the industry to assess the severity of a vulnerability. When you find a bug, it, it's either a low severity, medium severity, high, or critical. So when you have an understanding of the CVSS, you want to double down on each component of the CVSS. You want to make sure to demonstrate that you can affect confidentiality with your bug. You want to make sure you demonstrate that you can affect 
effect availability and integrity, etc. So und understanding CVS is important. Also, uh, think out of the box. When you got a bug, uh, you don't know what to do with it. Just think out of, out of the box. Think out of the box. Think of creative ideas. There are always some ideas. There are always some chains that you can you can you can use with your bug. Exactly. So when you find the low hanging fruit bugs, like a, a simple bug, a low bug, for example, an open redirect. Usually, when you submit an open redirect for a company, it gets paid like 100 bucks, 200 bucks, depends on the program. But what I personally do, I don't submit that that bug for the organization. I keep it for myself and I wait for the opportunity to use it with another vulnerability so I can chain it and maximize my impact. Same thing goes for open redirect, cookie injection, for example. If you find an exorcist without any security impact, don't submit it to the program. Keep it for yourself because at one point if you keep hacking on that company, you're probably going to use that exorcist along with another bug to maximize your impact. Also, may always make sure you abide by the program rules. Sometimes you, you, you find a bug and you want to maximize your impact. You want to access their internal network. You want to extract internal data. You have to be careful what kind of data you're extracting from the company because some, some, some people, they find an SSRF and they start, they start pivoting in the internal network of the company, which is bad. Or sometimes when you're testing, uh, when you're extracting user data, Always use your own account. Use two accounts. Do not extract other users' data. That will violate the company's rules, and I'm pretty sure you're not going to get paid for your work. So always abide by the program rules and be careful what you, what you do when you try to maximize the impact. All right. When we talk about boundaries, nowadays we started talking about collaboration. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, some of my bugs, I found them in collaboration with some friends. Collaboration is very powerful. Why? Because like everyone, when you're working with someone else, everyone brings a different skill set to the table. Maybe I'm good at web hacking and the other guy is good at mobile hacking. And we, we when we combine that, it's, it's a powerful collaboration. From, from, just from my experience, some of the most impactful vulnerabilities that I've seen myself were, uh, were, were a result of collaboration between a team or just two people. So if you're doing back bounties, you want to get to know other people, you want to start collaborating with them so you can join forces. Uh, as I said, everyone brings a different skill set. Uh, even back bounty platforms like HackerOne, they recognize that collaboration is in, in, powerful. So what they started doing is they started building features to support collaboration. Now on HackerOne, you can add someone as a collaborator to your report. You can even split bounty automatically. So they're just keep adding in features to support collaboration. Also, if you're stuck somewhere, there are so many uh, communities out there online. There is like HackerOne Discord where you can find so many bug bounty hunters. So if you're stuck someone, you can just shoot them your question. I'm pretty sure everyone will be happy to answer it. There is the Nahamsik Discord uh, community, the bug bounty world Slack. If you just Google those, I'm pretty sure you're going to find the link to access those communities. So this is one way to collaborate with other people because... Uh, because trust me, collaboration is very powerful and I've seen a lot of people make great progress just collaborating with other people. But when you're collaborating, when you're working with someone, you have to be very, you have to be very, uh, to have, to agree upfront on, on some terms. For example, if you find a bug together, how much is going to be the split? Is, are you going to split the bounty 50-50? Because I've seen a lot of conflicts arise because of that. Like they find a bug and this one wants 30%, the other guy wants 50%. So you have, before you even start collaborating, you have to, to agree on the bounty split. And also you have to uh, make sure uh, that if, if it's a, a unique security research, the other partner is not going to leak it. Because some people, they do security research and it get leaked to the public. So you want to be uh, very upfront on that regard. Okay, just talking about collaboration, this is a Twitter DM I received from a guy. So basically, he found an SSRF, which is a low severity SSRF. It's a, it's a, it's a known CVE. So this guy... It was like, hey, bro, uh, I know you're very good at SSRF, and I got this, uh, this SSRF, which is low severity. He wants to maximize the impact because uh, he, he, as a low, it would, it would get paid 100 bucks. So if he managed to maximize the impact, it will be worth a lot more. So what I like about this guy is he's actually, he's very, uh, like, 
from advanced, he's like, I will share, it's, it's going to be like a 50-50 bounty split, as I mentioned earlier, you should agree up front about the bounty split. So he gave me the details. So this guy, basically, uh, this is a Confluence uh, instance. He managed to uh, send an external, hit, I mean to hit external websites with the with this SSRF. Like hitting external websites is not, there's not, there's not, there's not much impact there. Uh, so as you can see, the URL parameter is the one vulnerable. We pointed it to the Burp Suite collabor collaborator, and we can see the response. So it's a, an SSR for the response, which is a good start. But this, this is low, right? So I tried to point it to the local host uh, address, uh, and I managed to to hit the internal network of the company, and I was I received welcome to Nginx, which means uh, I access the internal network. But there isn't much you can do with this. I mean, I managed to access the internal network, but there isn't much. There's much impact here. So I wanted to escalate the impact furthermore, uh, because this would have been just a P2, like a, maybe a medium severity bug. So I want to escalate the impact. So I noticed that the 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 company or the instance was hosted on AWS Amazon Web Services. So what I thought about next is maybe I will try to hit the metadata endpoint. If you guys are familiar with the cloud uh, AWS metadata endpoint, which has security credentials stored there. So I basically pointed the URL parameter there in the request. I pointed it to the metadata address. But unfortunately, I got 401, which is unauthorized, which is where normally when you send a get request to the metadata endpoint, you get, you get a response. So I couldn't understand what was happening. So I kept searching and looking and reading documentations, and I came to realize that the company here, they're using a different version of the metadata endpoint. So in, in the past days, there was, there was the, EC2, the MDS, the version one. So basically, if you just send a GET request to the metadata endpoint, you're going to get a response back. But the new version, which is way more secure, it actually requires you to send a put request to, with, with the, with a special header to the metadata endpoint, and you get a token, and a session token, and then with that token, you can send an authenticated request to the metadata endpoint and then you can extract the the security credentials this is a long process i i i, I thought maybe this is a dead end i couldn't i, I don't think how I, could, I would be able to escalate this furthermore but i kept reading and what i realized is that the confluence installation here actually uses the google gadgets api which is defined by open social specification and what i realized is that this endpoint it takes the HTTP method parameter, the post data parameter, and the headers parameter, which means I can control the the HTTP request method. I can control the post data and the header, which is all I need to uh, make the uh, attack scenario uh, a success. So what I did next is I sent a put request to the metadata uh, to extract the session token. When I got the session token, uh, I used that session token to send another request, uh, another post request to the metadata, uh, the security, the security credential endpoint with the, with this, the session token in the header, as you can see there. And finally, I managed to extract the, the security credentials. And this is maximum impact because this is a critical. So basically, because of collaboration, that guy reached out to me on Twitter. We managed to escalate a low severity bug to a critical bug, and it got paid the maximum. So this is why I'm saying collaboration is very powerful. If you're stuck somewhere, you know someone with the right skill set, just reach out to them. I'm pretty sure uh, they're going to help, and they will be happy, especially, especially if you're going to split the bounty. So I'm just going to talk about my experience managing backbound programs. I'm, oh yeah, all right, all right, yeah, last words. Uh, so basically, bug hunting is, is not a race. It's not a race, it's a marathon. So it requires to be consistent. It requires you to be persistent and have patience. It really requires patience because sometimes uh, it takes so long to find a bug or it takes so long to get paid. So you have to have patience. Take as many notes as you can. A lot of people, they start hacking and then they close everything down without taking any notes. A lot of my amazing bugs is because of the notes that I've taken over the year. So take as many notes as you can and also keep learning. Don't don't stagnate. Keep learning because there's there are always new technologies, new techniques, new security research. So if you want to stay ahead of the game, if you want to be one of the top bug bounty hunters, you have to keep learning every day. And also bug hunting can be 
can drain your mental health. It's, you can hit burnout very easily because it's not easy. So you want to do a lot of other activities on the side and just, just really have fun. It's supposed to be fun. That's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.